Welcome to Tuesday. It is TSOT time. Talk and science on Trek Zone. Dr. Brad Tucker is with me as he always is on a Tuesday. Brad, welcome to the show. How's it going? Happy Tuesday. Yeah, it's a it's a nice Tuesday, Space Tuesday. You know, it's uh, a <laughs> it's uh, another three hundred sixty five days since the last <laughs> April thirtieth, and it's already the eighteenth week of twenty nineteen. See, but see, this is the thing about space. Like, you just say, because it's just revolving around the sun, Happy New Year. I'm going to artificially make a new year today. And then you can wipe everything clean and have a redo. It's like playing golf where every hole you get a mulligan. <laughs> I love it. That's the way I view it. That's about, that's about my best golf stroke, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. Well, hey, there's three, three headlines uh, that we want to discuss today. The first one uh, is uh, earth shattering. Or should I Mar- should I say Mars shattering? We've recorded a Mars quake. Look, I think this is really cool. You know, feel the the Mars move beneath your feet. Um, you're right. You know, what do you call a Mars quake on an earthquake on Mars? A Mars quake. Um, and and this was one of the goals of the Insight mission. Uh, so this was a probe NASA built and landed on uh, Mars. It landed about late November last year. And the goal was to start studying underneath the surface. What is going on underneath, i.e. getting insight into the activity of Mars? And one of the big questions was, are there earthquakes or Mars quakes? And now we know that answer. And the answer is yes. It's absolutely incredible that because Mars doesn't have tectonic plates like Earth. Uh, so what's causing these tremors? Well, and I think this is the exact question is what actually is the crust of Mars made up of? We've never seen activity for tectonic plates in the past. Um, maybe there is something there. We know Mars has volcanoes just as the Earth does. In fact, the biggest volcano, Olympus Mons, um, which is over 500 kilometers wide, is essentially the size of France is on Mars, so it could erupt, and you know, how does that work? So I think, you know, that's kind of one of the cool things is that we know a lot about Mars, kind of, but we don't know, you know, the history of the planet, the development of the planet, what's going on, and even this relates to future living on Mars, what stopped the core in Mars from generating magnetic field that protects it from radiation? This is all intertwined into knowing the dynamics of Mars. I think the incredible thing about this is the fact that Insight was on the planet for this tremor, um, and it was released. Uh, they released it through the Twitter account. Um, best tweet, I think. Mars, I hear you. I've detected some quiet but distinct shaking on Mars. The faint rumbles appear to have come from the inside of the planet. Let's take a listen to that. Brad, that is absolutely incredible to hear that from another planet. And I believe that it was recorded earlier this month, er, earlier in April. Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, I think they had one late March and then a series of them in April. And that's the cool thing is, like, they had a series of tremors in April, just as we get here. Um, And, you know, they picked up the wind. It's all kind of eerie, creepily sound. It's really cool. And and this really, again, helps figuring out the dynamics. We've always thought that Mars quakes would be longer and more violent uh, because of the way that the composition is of Mars. And so if you're thinking about future settlements on Mars, structures have to be made differently than what they have to do here on Earth. You know, it's one of those funny things, right? If we talk about doing stuff on the moon, we're pretty sure nothing's happening on the moon, so you don't have to worry about it. But if Mars has windstorms, it can have dust storms, it can have earthquakes, it can have volcanic eruptions, you need proper structural engineering, but for Mars, like, it's a real problem that you kind of maybe don't think about, but if that's where civilization's headed to go to Mars, we need to get, be building things on Mars. <laughs> and I suppose it opens up a whole new industry as well, where there's uh, earthworks industries here in Australia, I guess, that they would have to have subsidiaries and have Mars works. That's right. Mars works and Mars workplace health safety. <laughs> workplace health safety on Mars is a very different beast altogether. The great thing about it, though, at least, is a little bit easier to lift things because of the lack of gravity. This is true. So automatically you can carry three times as much. On the on the other side, you could be expected to carry three times as much. That's, that's, that's right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and luckily the day is about the same length, so you know a Martian day is to be a little bit more slave labor, but, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you know, hopefully, hopefully not. Hopefully, we get things right when we land them. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Well, something that's just as cryptic as Mars Workplace Health and Safety, uh, Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos's company, the the Amazon CEO, they put out a tweet uh, last week, which included a date and a and a ship from a long time ago. What's what's going on? So, so we haven't heard a lot from Jeff Bezos, and that's not because Blue Origin isn't doing a lot. Is In fact, Blue Origin has been around since 2002, around the same time as SpaceX. They've always been more of a private company. They haven't been as public, but now in the past couple of years, they've been really trying to open up um, and now starting to win on other contracts. Um, and so they announced this really cryptic tweak, and people dissected it. And the picture is of Shackleton's ship, Shackleton going to Antarctica. Now, obviously, they don't really care about Antarctica, but on the moon, the south pole of the moon is named the Shackleton Crater after Shackleton the Explorer, the picture in the boat. Oh. And now there's so much activity and buildup of getting to the moon, and Blue Origin has had successful suborbital launches. So just like SpaceX, their rockets go up and land back down. They've been nailing it. So... I think most people are feeling that Blue Origin is going to make an announcement of a play for the moon and heat up the moon space race. And, of course, the Blue Origin uh, spacecraft is the new Shepard, um, and as you say, they're, they're quite successful, and they are competing with SpaceX. It's sort of a little bit of a race between uh, Blue Origin uh, SpaceX, and I think it's Boeing as well, isn't it? They're, they're trying to get up as well. That's right. So Boeing has the, the capsule going to humans. And so they've always kind of divvied up and done a little bit different things. But I think what we're starting to see now is that the market is now matured, that things are becoming more and more evolved. The goals are becoming loftier. And at the same time, NASA has had their own issues where, you know, there's kind of this vacuum of where these private companies are, are fueling. And it really is a private company race back to the moon. I think it's kind of amazing. It's also interesting. And, you know, we shouldn't discount India's in there, China's in there as well. So it really is this huge activity. And so I'm not surprised Blue Origin's getting on it. I mean, we'll have to wait to see what they say, but most people are planning on the move. Well, one place I don't think many people are planning on visiting uh, anytime soon, uh, Black Holes. Um, and scientists at Curtin Uni have uh, found some swinging jets of plasma. So, yeah, you know, one of the things I think we, we don't think about often, you know, we talked about the black hole image the other week, is that things shoot out of a black hole. And that's because black holes actually are spinning. As we saw in that first image of a black hole, it is a sphere. And so that sphere is spinning around. And if stuff hits that sphere, it bounces off. If it doesn't get sucked in, and shoots off in jets. And we've always seen jets as kind of what we thought as poles, like you go up one direction and back down the other. And that was it. But what this discovery showed is they kind of almost like fire hoses that as it's spinning around, they're spraying around everywhere and they shoot, seeing this stuff shooting it off in all directions. That's very fundamental for proving the activity of black holes, how they spin and how gas falls onto the black holes. It's incredible too the way that they uh, made these uh, measurements and and got these images because it's another network of 10 telescopes uh, looking at uh, V404 Cygni for about four hours, they got some really clean images uh, about this. Is this the way we're sort of moving now? We're, we're developing a, um, a an Earth-sized telescope of network telescopes to see further and, and more clearly. It's always been something that's been working on, what we call VLBI, um, Very Long Base Long Interferometry. That's the Australian or, you know, this hemisphere's version. And it's been around for about a decade. One of the things I think that's finally catching up is the computing power to process all of that image and that data in real time. And the, the, the important tricky thing is with that black hole image a couple of weeks ago, that was a single image. This was actually a series so they can see the activity changing over time. So they had to create a movie at this resolution of the Earth. And again, it's really important. I think that's where things are moving. We can find creative ways you know, the square kilometer away is a good, good example of this big radio telescope. There's a whole bunch of dishes connected together of, you know, essentially using physics creatively and getting around engineering problems. And it's only going to get better and better. We really need to get to the dark side of the moon, don't we? And, and we're going to find so much more uh, out about our universe. Oh, yeah. It, it really is. It's one of these things. It's always been a long dream of radio astronomers to build something on the far side of the moon. And it's always been kind of like, oh, yeah, it'll never happen. But now people are landing on the moon and people are carrying experiments to the moon. Everyone's kind of like, all right, well, this actually might happen. Um, 
And at some point, you know, it's a cost thing. It's going to cost more. But if it's the best thing that you could ever build on the earth in 100 years, you're going to do that, right? Because so far, there's no mobile phone towers on the moon. I, I, I think the worst part about it, though, is that a bit of Australian cultural identity is going to be lost because we're no longer going to be uh, installing new radio telescopes in the middle of sheep paddocks. No, that's right. But maybe we can get some moon sheep. I don't know. Right. Instead of counting how many sheep jumped over the moon, they could just be jumping on the moon and help people go to sleep. <laughs> we'll solve two problems at once. Well, Brad, uh, it is absolutely fantastic to, to talk to you every Tuesday for Talk and Science. Uh, and the best part is people are going to be able to listen to you. We do have to get some plugs for your public events coming up. And I believe that you're in WA next week. That's right. So I'm headed off to WA uh, next week. I'll be in uh, per northern part of Perth on Tuesday and then down to Bunbury on Wednesday and back to um, Perth on Thursday. So I'll be visiting a bunch of schools and doing some free public events where I'm going to give a talk and I'll bring in telescopes. So we'll talk about all the cool things that we're doing, talking about more. Plus, we'll do some stargazing afterwards. So they're all free. Um, they're all completely kids friendly. You know, just search online and try and book so we know how many chairs to set up. <laughs> so if you search for the universe in the future of space, either um, on my Facebook page, Dr. Brad Tucker, or online, they should come up. Um, and it's really cool. And I'm going to be going around to other places in Australia. So uh, I will be in a place near you. Not in a creepy way. <laughs> in a public event with a couple of telescopes. You'll kind exactly. of see him from afar. That's right. <laughs> well, of course, I do strongly recommend that everyone, of course, like Dr. Brad Tucker on Facebook as well. Um, some great posts uh, about sp science and space news uh, that is happening all the time. As we said, that started this year, Brad, science never sleeps. Science never sleeps, and that is uh, that was my uh, Anzac day. We had a gravitational wave event that happened of two neutron stars colliding, and 40 different telescopes around the world were trying to find a needle in a haystack. <laughs> Fantastic, Brad. Well, thanks as always for talking science uh, this Tuesday, and uh, we'll see you next week. Sounds good.